Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the crystal sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who wast and art and nevermore shalt be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, Though the eye of sinful men thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Morning. Morning and welcome home. And happy Love Like Olivia Day. We're excited for this. It's, um, it's going to be a great day. Um, if you're visiting with us, it is a big deal today because it is Love Like Olivia Day. And so we're happy to have our visitors with us. We're, you picked a good day to be here. Um, make sure you take a moment to fill out a card on the back of the pew in front of you so that we have um, a record of your, your attendance, whether you're a visitor or whether whether you're a guest or whether you're, you're a member. Um, and then if you, if you are guests, make sure you take the opportunity to hang around for a little bit and give us a chance to get to know you and talk to you. Well, I also want to welcome everybody that's watching online, whether that's on Facebook or YouTube or however that happens to be. Make sure you leave a comment on that so that um, we're able to engage with you and we look forward to you taking the opportunity to joining us in person when you get that chance. Make sure you get a bulletin this morning. Um, if you didn't get one emailed to you, uh, make sure you get one this morning. There's a lot of information in that bulletin. It is just, I think it's just a white bulletin this morning. Um, and so make sure you get, get one of those. Uh, if you'd like to have it emailed to you and, and you don't get it that way, contact Peggy up here at the office sometime and she'll, she'll get you on that list get it emailed to you. And so a couple of announcements before we get started. Like I said, today is the second annual Love Like Olivia Day. Um, that begins, those festivities begin at 1 o'clock. If you weren't able to participate in last year, you missed out. Um, take the opportunity to be a part of that this year, it is, it is, even if you can just do part of it, it is very uplifting and, and encouraging to everybody that, that's a part of it. It begins at 1 o'clock today over here, so go get a quick lunch and then meet back here at the Fellowship Hall at 1 o'clock. This coming Friday night, the 26th at 7 p.m., Fort Osage is hosting an FCA Fields of Faith event, um, which those are really neat. Uh, if you've not ever attended Wood, um, they are they are very uplifting. It, it it is great to see the the young people involved and stuff like that. And they do a lot of the organization and the presentation of all of those things as well. So it is Fort Osage has a new field house out there, new gym. And as an alum, I'm you know I'm failing because I haven't had taken the chance to go see this new field house yet, but supposedly it's really awesome, and that's where they're doing it. Um, and Tristan will be one of the speakers, so you know, take that opportunity to go support Tristan and support all those young people doing that. My dreams are dashed now. 
that was my excuse to go see the, the new field house. But I guess I should still go check it out. Um, so, okay. But still, it's still Friday night at 7, right, Tristan? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're still, we're still there. Um, and then the Mother's Day Boutique will be on May 4th. There's a sign-up sheet over here in the Welcome Center. If you'd like to help with this event, if you have any questions about it, contact Kelly Henley. So those are the announcements I have. So now if you'll bow with me, we'll start the service with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here, for all that you do for us, um, for all that you do that allows us to be here and, and to gather in your name and to encourage one another. We, we pray that, that the words shared and that our actions shared this afternoon as we go around um, spreading the love that, that, that we learned from Olivia, that, that those things are uplifting to you and, and they bring honor to you and glory to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning <clears throat> comes from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we also, and so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. stand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love, and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, he taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up, and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings each moment he crowns and fills with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, O oh, glory to God, for such a Redeemer as mine. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my soul in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. 
when clothed in his brightness transported, I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, in shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of a rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me, ever guide me, Christ behind me, Christ before, Christ my love, my life, my Lord, then a wife from heaven, lover of my soul, peace of God so ever present, I surrender my control to Christ above me, Christ beside me, Christ within me. each other. But the main thing is that God loved us. Oh, how he loved you. Oh, how he loves me.
supplies, raise your hand, and we've got some people that will bring that around to you. So just raise your hand and keep it up there. Holy God in love he come to the por portion of our assembly worship to reflect on and have serious meditation during the Lord's Supper. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John chapter 6 and try to help us to get really the, the heart and the attitude that we should always have when we take the Lord's Supper together. I just love the songs we've had this morning. Oh, they make me cry, bro. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. I'm going to start in the middle in verse 16 because it leads us up to Jesus talking about being, as we sang, the bread of life that came from heaven. And this is kind of a contextual way of understanding that. If you will, pick up with me in verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were headed. The next day, the crowd had, that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that he had gone away alone. Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowds realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. Just prior to this actually occurring, Jesus had performed a miracle most of us are pretty familiar with when he fed about 5,000 people. It was really more than that. And they didn't have a lot of food to start with. And we know that he multiplied the loaves and the fishes. And the scripture tells us that everyone had enough to eat. It's kind of like a flashback to Exodus and the manna that God had provided for the Israelites as they were traveling along. And sure enough, 
These people made that connection. In fact, as we continue to read here, we find out what they were really coming for. Begin in verse 25, and we're almost done with the reading. When they had found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You're looking for me not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we come before you as a congregation of your people. We exalt your name. Father, we praise you and thank you. You're worthy of all of our praise, our devotion, certainly our obedience. Father, but today at this time, we're thinking about how your son came here and meditating on how we treated him the whole time he was here. Father, help us to remember how much Jesus loves us. Help us to think about how much nonsense and bad motives and motivations he dealt with throughout his entire ministry as he's facing the cross. And help us to realize and remember him today as we partake of this bread of life that he feeds us from heaven. Help us to think seriously about our Lord. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. In need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above, in need of strength, in need of peace, in need of things that only you can give to me. In need of Christ, the perfect Lamb, my refuge strong, the great I am. This is my song, my humble plea, I am your child, I am in need, in need of grace, in need of love, in need of mercy raining down from high above, in need of strength, in need of peace, 
in need of things that only you can give to me. In need of Christ, the perfect Lamb, my refuge strong, the great I am. This is my song. It's rather telling as Jesus confronts the people that came to see him again what their motives were. They were selfish. I'm glad none of us are like that now. But you know, isn't it wonderful how Jesus handled that? Isn't it incredible how that he's always giving, giving, giving? And when we come together to take the Lord's Supper, I, I love the fact that we really follow the Bible as best we can. Because in Acts 27, this is why we meet every Sunday to take the Lord's Supper. We find the disciples came together to break bread. And that coming together is very important. Because not only do we recognize that God loves us, but he calls us to love one another. And that this love will actually be a distinctive of the body of Jesus. Because people will see that don't really understand God, how much we love and are devoted to one another. And they'll know there's something special about us. That's what brought me here. I could feel the love in this fellowship. It was really the deciding factor for me. And you may regret that I'm here now, but I'm here. And it's not going to be easy to run me out. I've been ran out of a lot of churches before, but I think I'm at home here. I really do. But Jesus spilt his blood for us. And I think about this every single day. What an awful cost and price. As we take this fruit of the vine, let us remember how much Jesus gave up. He left heaven. He emptied himself and became lower than the angels a human, and we treated him so terribly, and he took it so wonderfully. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we come again in, in prayer. I'm so grateful for this memorial service that we can remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus. I pray, Father, that we will really contemplate just how painful and, and difficult and hurtful it was to Jesus to be so tormented and rejected and abused all the time he was trying to save us. As we take this fruit of the vine, may we celebrate his death this day of resurrection. For it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.
Let's stand while we sing this song. If you can. You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by even averted their gaze from the side. Sufferance the suffering you bore for us. Led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, you spoke not a word, but chose to be silent though you did no wrong. Nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come. Yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name. He has enthroned you on if I had nothing to say right now. <laughs> yeah, no, that wouldn't be a surprise. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was surprised this morning. I got here this morning. I'm stepping out of the car, and I realized, man, I don't, I don't have my belt on. And I don't know, but the rounder I become, the more that's, that's essential. Uh, and so I sent Tyler back to the house to get the belt, and I thought, you know, I've never sent a grandkid for the belt before. Kids have gone after the belt lots of times. For totally different reasons, but uh, but anyway, it's good to be with you. Uh, you guys, uh, you look good in your shirts. I thought I'd be the only one, but no, uh, no, you guys look great. Rex, what a great job! Thank you, brother. Enjoyed those uh, those thoughts and needed them, and needed them. Uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I'd like to ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 19. And as you're doing that, let me just say, welcome home. It is good to have you home. It's even good to be back with you. I've uh, been on the road the last two weekends, and so it's good to, uh, to be back home and be with my people. Um, we're going to be looking today at uh, a lesson from our life group material. Uh, we've been looking at the kingdom parables. And I want to begin by reading a spot from the book of Matthew because the parable that we're looking at today, the parable of the vineyard workers, is only found in the book of Matthew. What's interesting to me, though, is there are some some verbiage that is in the book of Matthew before and after this that's found in both Mark and Luke, in fact, specifically Mark 10 and Luke 18. We won't take time to read those, but I want to read kind of a preliminary passage for us 
in Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 25, which reads as follows. When the disciples heard this, now what are they talking about? They're talking about the rich man that comes to Jesus, the guy who wants to know what he needs to do, you know, to have eternal life. And they begin to talk about following after the law, and, and he claims, man, I've done all of those things. And Jesus says, hey, one thing you like, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor. And the Bible says that the man went away sorrowful, and, and, and the disciples really had a hard time with that as I think you and I would if we were being honest with ourselves. And so then we read, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and asked, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And Peter answered him, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Yeah, I love Peter, right? I mean, he's our spokesman. If, if ever we had a spokesman, this is our boy right here. This is our guy. This is the ultimate don't be that guy guy, right? I mean, I love this guy. Well, I guarantee you, Peter and I, we have DNA that is shared. I can assure you of that. But Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, love that, when I set everything right, when, when, when everything is redeemed, when everything is restored, when everything is back to normal. We don't live normal. We thought we gave up normal four years ago. Wrong. Normal left at the garden. And so he says, when I restore these things, when I renew all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne... You, will have followed, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That sounds pretty good. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. That sounds great. Sign me up. I want some of that, don't you? Yeah, I mean, let's be honest. We want that. We crave that. That's what we want. That's what we need. And I'm going to tell you something. When God restores that, it's going to look a lot like that, isn't it? But it's also going to look a lot like this next verse. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. And I don't know about you, but that gives me a problem. That gives me a problem. I, I don't like waiting in line, particularly then to have the next line move quicker than my line. I've been standing here all day. I came in this morning. I'm going to get some coffee. I'm behind Jeannie, which is great. I'm behind Mark, which is great. I'm behind the clock but I don't have my belt, so i got to kill some time. So it's all good. And they get done. They get their coffee. Everything's great. I put my coffee in there, and the coffee pot's like, nope, not so fast. I'm like, what? i got, I got, I got, to, I got to wait? I had to preheat the coffee maker. They didn't have to preheat the coffee maker. Why am I being punished? Yeah? I had to preheat the coffee maker. That's the kind of generation we're in now, right? We stand in front of a microwave or a Keurig saying, come on. Come on, i got places to go, things to do. I preheat the coffee maker. I open it, I close it, despite all the warnings that were probably being flashed there. And it wants to preheat again. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, didn't we just do this? And it is preheating in an endless cycle of preheating. And finally, finally I get the all clear. But i got to lift it again. And, and put my cup under there, and finally the coffee begins to flow. And I'm thinking, how unfair is all this? They got their coffee right away. I've never wanted to push Mark over in the foyer in all my life. <laughs> Spill his coffee on his kid. That's me. Knowing i got to preach this lesson. That's still me. <laughs> what is wrong with me? 
I need, I need coffee. You think I need decaf. No, I need coffee. <laughs> so we get to looking at this parable. And Jesus is sharing for us something that we need to hear. And so point number one, it, it's kind of plain vanilla, I'll admit. Jesus shares the parable of the vineyard workers. So beginning in Matthew 20, at verse 1, we read these words. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. And he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. Now, here's what's interesting about these workers, okay? Not only did he go out early to hire workers, these guys showed up and they were ready. They had their their, their hard hat on. They had their lunch pail. They were ready to go. Some commentators have said this, and I believe it to be true. This guy probably went out early because he knew this. The best workers are the ones that are available the earliest in the morning. Now, I'm not picking on you if you sleep in. You know, if you wake up at the crack of noon, that's okay with me, okay? I realize some people work shift work. But in those days and in that time, if you wanted good workers, you went out early to find them because the best workers got picked up early. And so he goes and he finds these folks who are willing to work and they're excited about it. They pack their lunch pail. They've got their hard hat on. They've got their gloves. They're ready to go. And he says, all right, you're the ones. And he agrees to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. And about nine in the morning, probably three hours later, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. Got to love these guys, right? They just standing there. Do de do de do. They didn't pack their lunchbox. They don't have their hard hat on. If they have their gloves, they've got one glove. It's probably the left glove. They don't, you know, I mean, they're kind of a ragmatag group. They're not really looking to do anything, but he comes to them and he told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out about noon and about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. So we can assume that he went out about six o'clock in the morning, went back out at nine, found some folks who weren't maybe as eager as the first group, maybe not as skilled, maybe not as well thought about in the world of, of day workers, went back out at noon, three. Every three hours he's going, he's getting new workers. And I would dare to say, and some commentators say this, and I think there's probably truth in it, I guarantee you the quality of the workers was probably going down, down, down. Okay? Finally, I love this. You will too. <clears throat> About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? See, it's not like they weren't there before. They didn't just show up. They've been there all day. They've been there probably when some of the earlier calls went out. Hey, who wants to work in the vineyard? Raise your hands. And you know what they do with their hands? Whoop. Right down in the pockets. There's probably some of them in the crowd. Hey, wait a minute, I'm on a call. They, they didn't even have a phone, okay? But there's somebody in the crowd. I'm, I'm on a phone call, yeah. I mean, it was was a rough deal. These folks have been there all day. They've been passed over. I don't think they were too enthused to do anything. And here it is, 5 o'clock. And some of them are probably thinking, you know what? (laughs) We don't have shift work in this society. Isn't that great? We don't have 24-hour day Walmart. We don't either anymore. I think that's pretty cool. I'm glad we lost that. Who needs Walmart at 2? Okay, I'll admit I've been there too, but, but nonetheless... These guys realize, hey, if I go work now, I'm going to get something for an hour's worth of work. It may not be as much as the next guy, but I'm going to get something for my trouble. And so, he says in verse 7 something that's also interesting too, and I got ahead of myself. Because no one has hired us, they said. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Why are you standing here? Nobody's hired us. 
we're, we're probably not that good of workers. We didn't raise our hand. We, we, we didn't bring our gloves. We didn't pack our lunch. Well, we did, but we ate it about 9 o'clock this morning. We didn't bring the hard hat. The sun was in our eyes. Our pit crew was rushing us. They probably had a lot of excuses why they hadn't worked, but they hadn't worked because nobody really wanted them. People had looked them over. They had passed them off. They had rejected them. And he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. Now that's a good day if you're one of those guys, right? I only worked an hour and I got a day's pay. What a deal. They're happy. Goes on to say. And so went those who came, who were hired first. And they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. You know, if you're the guy at five, you are ecstatic. You're showing it off. Ha, 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 nanny, nanny, boo, boo. Look what I got. And if you're the guy at three, you're pretty happy. Those folks are pretty happy. Noon, hey, you got no complaints. Nine o'clock, probably not too bad. But if you got there at six o'clock in the morning and you worked all day, you're a little disgusted, right? I mean, let's be honest. Wouldn't that tick you off a little bit? Well, what's up with that? Tyler's getting as much, and he worked an hour as I am. I worked all day. Wait a minute. Jesus lays it out like that. And I don't know about you, but of all the parables I've heard, this one is one I can relate to the most in the sense that I would have been frustrated about this. You know, I would have been ticked off. I would have been stomping my feet around. I would have had a scowl on my face. And so I want us to look at some interpretations, if we will, about these parables. But I want us to read verses 11 and 12. When they received it, speaking of those who had been there all day, they began to grumble against the landowner. <laughs> these who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. They got a good point. It resonates well with me. Not so much with God. I want you to know that one interpretation is that the workers immediately began to grumble and complain when they received the pay they had agreed upon when this all started. They began to grumble and complain. How quick we are to grumble. How quick we are to complain. How quick we are to point our finger of judgment, even at God, and say, what were you thinking? This seems categorically unfair. I can't spell categorically, but it sounds categorically unfair. The workers began to demand fairness and equality at least on their terms. And we are quick to call for justice. We want justice. And that's what they wanted. This seems unjust. We worked here 12 hours. And these interlopers come in here at 5 o'clock. They worked an hour. They got the same amount of pay as we did. 
We only had a 30-minute lunch break and, and two 15-minute breaks. Our break time, they, they got a day's pay in that amount of time. They're upset, and I, I can relate, and maybe you can too. In purely human terms, from our perspective, this does seem a bit unfair to some degree, does it not? Verses 13 and 14. But he answered one of them. I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. That is deep. And it's a lot deeper than maybe we're going to have time to develop today. But that speaks of God's character. It speaks of His nature. We like to think about time. We like to think about justice and fairness from our point of view. God's justice and fairness is not moved by our thoughts of what it should be. And God isn't bothered by time. You know, we carry around three, four watches and don't know what time it is. Chinese proverb says a man with one watch always knows what time it is. A man with two or more never does. There's truth in that. We think a lot about time in, in, in our world. It's important. God's not so concerned about that. So I want us to see thirdly and lastly that I think Jesus could be sharing a deeper insight about the kingdom with this parable. You see, the workers failed to see God's grace was at work in the vineyard. How quick we are to miss the importance of God's grace and His timing, if you will. But again, God is not a being that's governed by time. We, we, we tend to think we are. How foolish. But to miss God's grace, to miss God's sense of timing? Matthew 20, 15 and 16 say this. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? There's something deeper than money going on in this parable. But basically what he's saying is, don't I have the right to do what I want to with my resources? Don't I have the right to do what I want to with the things that you find beneficial? Don't I have the right to do what I want to with the things you find of value? Don't I have the right to do what I want to with the things that I want to give to people? Don't I have the right to do what I want to in giving you what you can never earn for yourself. Don't I have the right to do what I want to when it comes to promising people what I will give them? I have the right. You have no right to question me. And yet we do. Now I got worked up. But I don't think in the parable he did. He goes on to ask, are you envious because I'm generous? The workers failed to see the significance of God's generosity. The workers failed to see the significance of his justice and fairness. The workers failed to see the significance of His grace. But more than all of that, I believe they failed to see the significance of His giftedness. He says, I'm giving to you what I promised. It's not what you've earned. You can't earn what I've promised. I'm giving all of you what I've promised. And it is fair and it is just and it is gracious because it is my gift to you. 
and never on your best day can you earn this. We are quicker to miss the significance of the fact that God has gifted us. The workers failed to see God's greatest challenge to working in the vineyard. We are to embrace what we often want to avoid, which is the challenge of the vineyard. The last will be first, and the first will be last. Just as verse 16 tells us. So the last will be first and the first will be last. Skipping down a little bit in this chapter to verse 20 through 28. Love this. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons. Her name has been taken from this account to protect the innocent, right? Maybe, I don't know. Mrs. Zebedee comes in like any great mom. She came to Jesus with her two sons and kneeling down, ask a favor of him. She gets down, kneels down, hands and knees, begging this favor of Jesus. What is it you want, he asked. Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? I want you to think about that, church. Can you drink my cup, he says. <laughs> I love their answer. We can, they answer. Oh, we lie, don't we? <laughs> Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my father. Now let me tell you what's interesting about that. God will pick and choose those folks. Do not be surprised if one or more of them is a 5 to 6 p.m. worker. I mean, if we read this parable and we show up, can you imagine what that would be like? We show up to the throne room of God and there's old Mr. 5 p.m. sitting over there, and we're thinking, what just happened? And we just failed the test right away, right? <clears throat> I love that passage. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Can you relate, church? I want you to notice the all-too-familiar refrain of unjustness, unfairness, and blaming God that it's probably about to take place here. And Jesus called them together. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. How well they knew that. And their high officials exercised authority over them. Oh, yeah, they could relate. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. That church, that's the cup. That's the cup. And that cup is filled with the wine from the vineyard. Jesus says, you worked in my vineyard so I can put something in your cup. And let me tell you what's going in there. You're not coming here to be masters and governmental authorities and rulers. No, you're coming here. You're going to be a servant. You're going to be a slave. But you're going to receive everything I promised. And that's good stuff. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In conclusion, beautiful word conclusion, we are far too quick to complain both to God and about him. Heaven forbid. We are far too quick to blame God for our frustrations. 
We are far too quick to demand and dispense, if you will, justice and fairness from our point of view, which really has nothing to do with true justice and fairness. We are quick to seek grace, but we are far too slow to share it. We have a sense that somehow we've been shortchanged by God all the while forgetting His innumerable gifts to us. And we are far too quick to want what God promised us right now, but we all deserve to enter into those promises together, not because we've worked for them and earned them, but because that's how he gives them out. One of my favorite and most challenging passages in the Bible is found in Hebrews 11, and we'll close with that. Beginning in verse 32, as he's talking about these great people of faith, he says these words, And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. About David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, uh uh-oh, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. These are the 6 a.m. workers. These are the ones who got there before we did. These are the ones that worked all day when we showed up at 9 or noon or 3 or more likely at 5 p.m. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had granted something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So the next time you think God's being unfair to you by letting some 5 p.m. or come in and get the full benefit, I want you to read about these people who had their brains kicked in for their faith. Never said this from the pulpit, but they had the snot beat out of them for their faith. They literally did. And who are we? To question God. Who are we to demand anything more than what He will give us and promise us? Because I can tell you something it's better than anything you will ever earn or deserve for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Some of you have been working in the vineyard a long time. Some of you might not be working in the vineyard at all. We are all called to be part of God's kingdom. We all have a place in that kingdom, and it is never too late for us to be part of that kingdom. We should all be about working for the man upstairs. That is what our life should reflect, and that's what we should all be about. You may not be in the kingdom right now. You may not be a child of God's. You may be that lazy person that said, nobody's called me. He is calling you. He is calling all of us to work in his vineyard, to be in his kingdom.
We sing a song, we haven't sung it for a long time, it's page 297, Ark, I'm going to sing it this morning, it was written in 1880, that's how long it's been around, and the name of that song is, I Want to Be a Worker for the Lord. Do you want to be a worker for the Lord? Do you want to trust in Jesus' power to save? He says in that song, all who truly come, truly come, will find a happy home in the kingdom of the Lord. We should all be wanting to work in that vineyard of the Lord. There's no greater promise than Revelation 3.20. It says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door in his heart, I will enter into him and live with him and he with me. Perhaps some of you have closed that door. Perhaps some of you are not letting him into your heart into your life to live with him and him live with you he can change that he can change your life in spite of all your circumstances he can bring you and me out of darkness into light so if you think you're living in darkness accept him love him live for him work in his kingdom be part of his kingdom he can bring you out of despair into hope and really out of death into resurrection we need to remember that Matthew eleven twenty eight says come to me all you who are weary and are burdened and I will give you rest to your soul these are the very words of Jesus he brings forgiveness and hope to all of us but only if you allow him to live in your heart and in your life we give you an invitation opportunity every Sunday morning to come to know Jesus deeper, to have a relationship with him, to put him on in baptism if you haven't done that yet, to recommit your life to him, to say, I am going to let him live within me. And we're going to share, the get, share together my life, him living in me and I living in him. The elders will be around the auditorium this morning. If you have needs or prayers that you'd like to be prayed for, with, or about, we would love to share that time together. But I just want you to remember mostly this morning, he wants you to be working in his vineyard. He wants you to be in his kingdom. And if you're not, I would just ask you to reflect on your life and say, why not? Am I ready to go to work for him? Would you all stand and sing the song? Gentle Shepherd, come and meet us, for we need you to help us find our way. Gentle Shepherd.